Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from NVIDIA. We have Steve Keckler, who's the Director of Architecture Research at the company. And um, Steve, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much. Hey, it's my pleasure. You know, the, the origins of this call is uh, I came across some slides that were shown at, at uh, SC11. And out of context, I didn't know what to say about them. So uh, uh, NVIDIA was kind enough to line you up and tell us more about the, the Echelon project and why you got involved and what it means to uh, NVIDIA and uh, you know the HPC community at large. So uh, why don't you tell us more, Steve? Great, yeah. So uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is um, our, our thoughts that are uh, far-reaching, sort of past, past the end of, uh, of where GPU computing is today. We're thinking quite, quite heavily about uh, GPU computing and its future for HPC, and, uh, and particularly as it reaches to exascale. Uh, so to that end, we've launched a, a project within NVIDIA uh, in, in, the, in the research organization uh, that has an external name of Echelon that is aiming at developing technologies that will help us bridge the gap from where we are to the exascale domain uh, by the end of the decade. Um, so today, what I'm going to tell you about um, is uh, provide a little bit of a brief uh, overview of GPU computing. Uh, we've come a long way in a very short period of time. I want to put, the, uh, put GPU computing in context uh, for your readers. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the particular challenges facing extreme-scale parallel systems. As we go, to, go towards exascale, there's some pretty heavy challenges we've got, to, we've got to, to solve, and these things are not things that, that are, are at all obvious how to, how to manage. Um, so I'll be talking uh, about two particular challenges there. And those are really sort of a lead, in, lead into a description of the project and our goals um, for Echelon as we try to reach towards, towards exascale. So let me first talk a little bit about uh, GPUs um, and where they have come from in the last decade or so. So when we think about GPU computing, it, it's, it, as, I, as I've given this talk over the last couple of years, it's become easier to give the talk because more and more people are aware of, of GPUs and that are used for, for computing. But it's worthwhile to take a step back and think about three eras of GPU computing. So um, you know, in the early 2000s, uh, NVIDIA realized that uh, for, the graph, for the purpose of graphics, there was a lot of value in adding programmability to the underlying systems um, to give access to game developers to the high um, math and uh, memory bandwidth that were, uh, that were available on the chips. Um, and an, an intrepid set of researchers that around that time said, you know, this is pretty interesting. We've got this programmable platform that has tremendous capabilities, uh, and we think we can use it for other interesting applications such as fluid dynamics or other scientific uh, uh, programs. Um, but it was hard for them to do it. They, they basically had to describe their, their algorithms and disguise them uh, as graphics pipeline shaders. And they did that and wrote a lot of papers about that. Based on, on some of those insights, there was sort of the obvious next step for NVIDIA to take as a company, which brings us to our GPU computing 2.0. And that was really where people could now program the GPU directly with modern programming languages. No longer did you have to think about casting your, your algorithm as uh, a graphic shader. Uh, you can now use a new language, or, which is effectively extensions to uh, the C programming language, to now take advantage of the math capabilities uh, and the compute computational capabilities inside GPUs. I would argue that today we are well into uh, GPU computing version 3.0, uh, where it has really gone mainstream. Um, there's over 100,000 active CUDA developers, tremendous number of independent software vendors, tools, libraries, external parties who are developing uh, applications uh, and capabilities for uh, GPU platforms. And furthermore, uh, it has pervaded the academic community. Uh, there's well over 500 universities now teaching CUDA as a part of their curriculum. So in some sense, GPUs in the academic world have now become an easy entree into parallel computing, in part because they're so pervasive. Just about everyone has a, a massively parallel computing device in their laptop or desktop. So you might ask sort of why uh, graphics and compute uh, ended up being you know, sort of fused together in a single device. Um, and it really has to do with the overlap between the characteristics of the two application domains. Uh, both graphics and many aspects of, of, of scientific computing have a demand for high arithmetic 
uh, arithmetic and memory bandwidth. Um, graphics in, port, uh, in particular, throughput is more important than latency. Um, as long as you, uh, you know, compute what the pixel should look like by a certain deadline, it doesn't matter if, you know, how fast you, fit, you know, finish that certain pixel. What matters is the frame rate. Well, it turns out that uh, uh, as you do scientific computing, there's many problems that are cast in that same, uh, in that same realm. Um, GPUs uh, are programmed explicitly using fine-grained threading, which is pervasive through the architecture and the programming system. Uh, many people have, have found, it, found the, the programming paradigm uh, easy to reason about, both on the graphics side and on the compute side, uh, which has enabled this fusion. And then finally, the, the, one of the distinguishing features of, of this, which facilitates this very fine-grained thread and massive parallelism, is the hardware support for thread management. Things like hardware support for thread creation and synchronization, scheduling, and memory allocation. All of those features are required to enable the fast launch uh, and execution of massive uh, amounts of parallelism. And I'll talk a little about what the parallel capabilities are in, in modern GPUs today. So let me say a, a brief word about what the, uh, what, the, what the programming model looks like um, at the lowest level. So CUDA is the, is the programming system. Uh, we just celebrated recently uh, the five-year anniversary of the, of the launch of, of CUDA. Um, and it's a programming model that, is, that has bulk uh, parallel semantics with support for very fine-grained threads. So when you write a, a CUDA program, you really think about uh, what an individual thread will do, right? an individual scalar thread. And you think about that thread then being replicated many, many, many times to operate on uh, separate pieces of data, in a data level parallel system. So this thread that we see on the upper left hand side, um, we can aggregate many of those together in our pro in when we think about writing programs into something we call a block. And those threads that are in a block are intended to interact with, with one another very frequently um, and to exploit characteristics of the hardware that make that uh, communication and synchronization fast, such as local barriers that enable you to reason about um, uh, what is in memory at what time between different parts of your, uh, your parallel program. The third level is that these multiple blocks get aggregated into these things called kernels. And multiple blocks in a kernel can execute simultaneously on different parts of the GPU. So we effectively have, have two levels of, of parallelism in here. Uh, and different kernels are then separated by these global barriers. What's also important is to understand uh, at the lowest level uh, for low-level programmers is the memory model. Okay. So an individual thread has access to per-thread local memory. When you write your, your uh, thread code, uh, you can use that per-thread local memory for things like the program stack, uh, local variables, or, or data structures that are really private to the thread. There's another level of, of the memory hierarchy, which we call per-block shared memory, which is accessible easily to all the threads in a block. This enables the threads that are working together to aggregate uh, their common data into a single location uh, that is very fast and uh, low energy to access. And then the third level of the memory hierarchy is the, is the per GPU global memory. Um, and this is uh, memory that ultimately is mapped into DRAM and, and then cached throughout the memory hierarchy uh, and is accessible to, uh, you know, to threads that, that reside in different kernels. Uh, so data structures that, that span different parts of your parallel program will ultimately map, be mapped into, the, into those memory locations and we'll be using uh, our global barriers to enforce the program semantics uh, and synchronize access to them. Now, uh, you know, our version of Hello World for, for parallel programming is you know, sort of the world's simplest uh, parallel program. Um, and so this example here shows a serial and a parallel version of a simple uh, AX plus Y loop. So in the top, you see uh, this, this sequential loop for i equals 1 to n. We're iterating through this array, and for every element, we're, we're multiplying uh, the scalar a by the vector element uh, x, adding to the vector element y, and then summing it together. The parallel version shown on the bottom has no uh, for loop. Um, you'll see that the, that the, the program snippet called uh, SACB parallel, that's a thread code that's going to be executed simultaneously across many, many threads. And all that code does is it computes an, an index variable based upon uh, which thread it is, and then uses that index variable to access into the array. So obviously, it's a very simple example, but it gives at least a little bit of a, of a notion of, 
of, uh, of how to be thinking about this data level parallel at the lowest level. Now, what's also important is that um, while this is a very low level example of programming, uh, you know, we're very concerned or very interested in making programming of GPUs more accessible, more accessible to, um, uh, to the programmer. So, for example, uh, uh, we recently uh, launched something called OpenACC, uh, which is a set of uh, programmer directives that allows a programmer to add hints to expose parallelism in their program rather than, rather than encoding the parallelism directly. Uh, we then rely upon the compiler to, to uh, do the mapping of that, of that code down to the underlying hardware. This approach of, of directives is similar in nature to what people uh, may be familiar with with uh, things like OpenMP, um, and similar to, uh, it can be mapped to both CPUs and GPUs. And this is an indicator of, our, of how we work with the ecosystem as well. This is a, an effort that we are we're collaborating with with companies like Cray, PGI, and CAPS. Okay, so let me move on and talk briefly about uh, current state of the art of GPUs. So if we look at um, a modern uh, GPU, this is, this is the diagram of, of the Fermi GPU, which came out uh, a couple of years ago. We're, of course, expecting uh, the, you know, the new version of the GPU's Kepler this year. Um, but uh, the GPU is decomposed into um, a collection of streaming multiprocessors, uh, which are highlighted on the right-hand side. Um, there we see a large number of cores. Uh, in addition to uh, local register files and storage, uh, which support the, the massive execution. So you can see there's a large number of green boxes, uh, which indicate the, the massive amount of parallelism that will be uh, exposed in the underlying hardware. If we dive in one, one level and we see what's actually inside the SM and the core, uh, that's where all the math units are. Um, and all the math operations are uh, in the format that people are comfortable with um, for scientific computing. Um, and we have a, a tremendous amount of, of a floating point uh, and integer bandwidth that can be executed within each one of these uh, each one of these SMs and of course across the cores. In terms of the memory hierarchy, uh, the uh, what's, what was new in, in Fermi and going forward was a true cache hierarchy. So uh, we have an on-chip uh, level one, level two cache, uh, which facilitates uh, access to less regular uh, data structures, which are common in many scientific applications. Uh, in addition, GPUs are well known for high memory bandwidth, and Fermi in particular has six GDDR5 memory controllers, which help supply massive amounts of bandwidth, um, you know, multiple factors more than high-end CPUs. And that's a feature that, is, that scientific programmers take advantage of. So if we kind of look at the tail of the tape, uh, the three columns we see here on this, on this slide represent the characteristics of the three generations of GPUs that have been launched uh, for GPU computing. And the most recent one, Fermi, uh, highlighted on the right-hand side. You can see some of the, some of the characteristics in terms of the, the growth in capability. Um, in, in massive increase in the amount of parallelism in the underlying chip, massive increase in the amount of, of, of um, uh, on-chip memory to support a wider range of applications. And if we look at the overall characteristics, uh, we've got a system that, consists, that uh, has a peak of, of over a teraflop of single precision performance and over 600 uh, gigaflops of double precision performance and approaching 200 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Just those underlying characteristics themselves make GPU platforms uh, very attractive to a wide range of, of programmers. And that, of course, is, what, is what's motivated them to be incorporated into supercomputers. Um, so if you look at the most recent uh, top 500 list published in November, uh, NVIDIA GPUs appear in three out of those, of those five machines. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, Oak Ridge National Labs which operates number three, Jaguar, um, they have announced uh, their plan to uh, develop the Titan machine, um, which uh, uh, they expect to be in excess of 20, 20 petaflops, uh, based on the next generation uh, video GPUs. Now, some people have accused you know, these, these machines to, uh, of being stunt machines that only run Linpack well, um, and that's just flat out not true. Um, they're being used uh, every day for real scientific problems. And so some of the examples, next few slides show, show, show some of those examples. So for example, um, uh, uh, in, in China, they now can run the world's fastest molecular dynamic simulation, sustaining almost two petaflops. Uh, in Japan, uh, at SC11, uh, they won one of the Gordon Bell Prizes um, for, uh, for a simulation code for material science. Uh, 
Again, uh, one of the Chinese machines has been used to simulate the H1N1 virus. And they're also being used in a whole wide range of applications from weather modeling um, uh, to fluid flow. So these are applications that, that scientists are using every day to solve their problems. Now, uh, another reason that they are, that they are attractive um, is, well, it's twofold. One is they're extremely energy efficient, and two, GPUs are commodity parts. You can buy GPUs going into high-performance computing systems from vendors like IBM, HP, uh, Dell, and so on. Um, what this diagram shows is for the top five machines, uh, both the, the uh, MinPak performance, these are the colored bars, the blue and the green bars, uh, as well as energy efficiency measured in megaflops per watt. Right? And what's interesting is that uh, um, when you compare the commodity-based systems, which is uh, Jaguar versus the GPU systems, GPU systems are, are many factors more energy efficient. Um, and we expect uh, the next generation of Kepler to, to give us yet another enormous boost. Um, so the, the availability of these systems uh, at large scale and energetically efficient is a huge attractive characteristic for GPU computing. So let me shift gears and talk a little bit about some of the challenges for parallel systems looking forward. So we really have two looming crises that I'm going to talk about today. There's a few other looming crises. Uh, one I've alluded to um, already, and that's power. It is power wall um, where every computer system we have today is limited by power in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and if we look at large-scale computers, they have limited amounts of power they can deliver to their, to their systems, measured in megawatts, but it's still limited. The other big wall is the programming wall. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those challenges as well as we reach uh, extremely large-scale systems. So as I mentioned, um, basically every computer system today, ranging from cell phones to supercomputers, are power constrained. When you live in that world, performance is equivalent to performance per watt for energy efficiency. So it's critical that, that uh, the computer vendors from top to bottom focus on energy efficiency to deliver performance. So you might ask, well, why is it different this time? Well, the truth of the matter is that uh, we have left the, the good old days. In the good old days, technology scaling, particularly uh, uh, attributed to um, Jim Dennard, uh, who coined the term of uh, Dennard's, Dennard's law, or Dennard's rule, um, dictated technology scaling, which said that as you uh, made your feature sizes smaller with transistors, your transistor sizes smaller, uh, they became more energy efficient. Um, if you uh, decrease your feature size by, you know, a factor of two, you can get four extra transistors and eight times the overall capability, uh, where capability is measured as transistor count times clock frequency, for the same power. Right? That's amazing. Eight times the capability, same power, going from, you know, one generation of technology to, you know, another. That is what has really powered the supercomputing world for megaflops, to gigaflops, to teraflops, and almost to petaflops. Okay. This rule has kind of have run, has run out of steam over the last couple of years. And so if you actually look at the system sizes that, that we're, the people are having today, they've actually increased in size in terms of cabinets and, and component counts. This was a great time. Okay. Technology was effectively giving us 68% per year in terms of performance per watt. That is huge compounded. It's, it's, it's hard to understate, or it's hard to overstate the impact of this. Now, the re reality is that we're no longer able to scale voltage down that gave us the benefits in the good old days. Now we're in a world where uh, if we have uh, the feature size, we now get two times the capability for the same power, not eight. But that really means that going forward, technology is really only giving us a, just under 20% 20, 20 per year in terms of performance per watt. That means every car other part of the system, architecture to software, has to make up the gap. Chips are now perform with power constraint, not area constraint. This is something I want to emphasize. They're power constrained and not area constrained. So how has this affected the computing industry? Well, we've actually seen this effect in the, main, in the mainstream CPU world uh, where, uh, where CPU companies have ceased to try to build more, more, more and more powerful unit processors and have gone down the road of, of multi-core trying to get more performance through parallelism, dialing back a little bit of the complexity in the clock rate, um, and trying to exploit larger and larger caches on die. 
So this is all well and good, but the problem is, uh, as, as we look you know, towards the world of exascale, things like CPUs are really fundamentally designed for single thread performance. They really want to execute one thread as fast as possible. Now we talked earlier about the importance of throughput computing. If you have parallelism, like parallelism degrees and tools need to have for exascale, you care less about single thread performance and care more about throughput. If you care about single thread performance, well, you're going to build systems with, with all the attributes I described here. That's clock rates, uh, speculation, uh, dynamic execution, a lot of things that, that improve single thread performance, but, but add an energy tax to the execution of your program. What this really results in is that in CPUs, a small fraction of the overall power goes to the business end of execution. And that's something that really has to change if we're going to reach, uh, reach towards exascale. This has manifested itself in you know, the die I've shown here. Uh, if you look at, at two die that there are two chips that have come out at similar times, um, somewhat different technologies, um, but uh, you know, the, the, the GPU on a per flop basis is on the order of five to seven times more energy efficient. Um, and that's a, that's a huge benefit that can be trans, translated into capability in uh, high performance computing systems. So if we look forward and think about what future systems really want to look like, there's been a whole bunch of studies that, that have, have thought about what exascale systems should look like. Um, and in talking to various different uh, customers who run computing centers, they would really like to see exascale in something you know, at or south of 20 megawatts. Okay. If, that's the, if you're going to reach that, that really means we need to be at 20 picojoules per flop sustained across the entire system. Right? which is you know, on the order of you know, 15 to 16 times uh, better than what we're seeing today. As we talked about earlier, process scaling is really going, going, to, going to provide us a linear factor improvement, or maybe a factor of four over that time frame, and we need to, to obtain another factor of four from other sources, better circuits, better architecture, and better software. So you might ask now, where is really the energy going? Well, we talked a little bit about per instruction overheads, things like instruction fetch, uh, register access, you know, those things that are required to execute the instruction. But what's interesting is that another very large factor, um, which is, has only grown in importance recently, has come from data movement. <coughs> so if you look at the, the diagram here, in the upper left-hand corner is a little green box, which represents uh, a math unit. Um, and in the 28 nanometer technologies are contemporary today, um, the amount of energy required to do that operation may be only about 50 picojoules. Okay. Um, now, the energy to get the, the operands, the actual uh, bits that needs to operate on, from a RAM that's located very nearby, just a millimeter away, is about 26 picojoules. Okay. That's just to access, uh, access, the, things, uh, access the data from a, from a near, very nearby storage from energy due to the wires. That energy increases linearly as you increase the wire length. So if you need to go halfway across, uh, across the chip, you're now spending uh, you know, three times as much, uh, sorry, five times as much energy uh, fetching the data than you are actually computing on it. And this just gets worse if you have to go off chip. So what I've sort of discussed describes some of the strategies that, that looking forward we need to, to focus on to reduce energy. We need to have simpler processor architectures that focus less on single thread performance and more on throughput oriented processing and minimizing the energy overhead per instruction execution. Uh, we need to find ways of reducing waste. Um, there's, there's lots of wasted energy uh, in many systems today that are spent redoing operations that, uh, that maybe shouldn't have been done in the first place. As I just mentioned, improving physical locality of data is critical. You need to maximize the likelihood of finding the data that you're looking for in the nearest level of the, of the memory hierarchy to where the computation is. Another uh, fruitful place will be to exploit heterogeneity and specialization. Not every core needs to be optimized to do the same thing, uh, and the specialization gives you an op opportunity to provide greater energy efficiency on certain types of, of operations which you may need to be able to do. And I'll, I'll show you this a little bit more when we, when we talk about echelon. And the final thing is that we need to work harder on pushing voltage down. That's still, we're close to the end of that, uh, that scaling, but it's, that's still a pretty large lever. And there's 
a lot of challenges there uh, that come up from the resiliency perspective if you try to push voltage down. Um, but nonetheless, I think we still need to focus on that area as well. Okay, so that was, that was the power wall. Let's talk briefly about the programming wall. So when we talk about programming, we really should, should talk about the, start by talking about the obstacles to programmability. So looking forward, some of the fundamental obstacles is really expressing the billion-way parallelism that we're likely to need in these large-scale systems. At the same time, in order to be energetically efficient enough, we need a way to also express locality so the system can exploit it. And then finally, uh, there's this interesting question of how do you ensure that all of the cores have a similar amount of work to do? If all the, if all the work got stacked up on a subset of the cores, you effectively reduce your parallel efficiency. There's also a collection of incidental obstacles, which I would argue are easily solved. Um, things like managing multiple address spaces. You know, some systems today, particularly accelerators, do have multiple address spaces. Um, you know, it is my firm belief that, the, that those multiple address spaces will disappear uh, by the time we get to the end of the decade, uh, you know, leaving programming systems that focus on that um, you know, behind. Um, partitioning data across nodes. Uh, you know, the, as we move to uh, systems that have a, a more uniform addressing uh, structure across the, the memory space, that will also become easier. Likewise, many of today's systems have very inefficient communication mechanisms for sending uh, messages and data between different parts of the system. Uh, it's relatively straightforward to bring down that overhead and enable the transmission of much smaller pieces of data, which will make it easier to, to, to extract much finer grain parallelism. So let's talk about thread counts briefly. Um, so here's a table that, that, that sort of stacks up the, the degrees of parallelism at different parts of the system. If you look at the 2011 column, this represents a system with, with 7,000 GPUs, uh, one that's on the, on, on the floor today. Um, and if you look at the stack up, by the time you get to the full-scale machine, there's capacity for about 170 million threads. That means, you know, in order to exploit the machine as a whole, you need to be extracting 170 million wave parallelism. Okay. That's a pretty big challenge, but clearly that, uh, you know, there are codes today that are able to exploit that. If you look at scaling, scaling things up, uh, we'll be well into the billion-way parallelism at the, uh, at the exascale. Um, and so you know, being able to expose billion-fold parallelism requires or will require fine-grained threading uh, of people's applications. So if we look at um, what hardware can provide to the programming system, uh, there's three things that are relatively straightforward to do. Uh, one is a shared global address space. Uh, so that um, an individual address or, or address that's used in one processor can refer to the same data regardless of which processor is using that address. That will facilitate uh, a lot of, or eliminate a lot of the complexities that arise in large-scale codes today. Um, second, I mentioned that uh, there's an opportunity to, to dra drastically reduce the overhead of small messages uh, and make it easier to mine out fine-grained parallelism. And then uh, third, it's easy to build mechanisms to make uh, or to facilitate very fast and efficient uh, global block transfers of data, which will make it less important to partition data across individual nodes and will make the programming system a little more uniform. So when we think about programming systems, we think about a layered approach here, where at the bottom are these efficient mechanisms and hardware as just described. In the middle is a, uh, uh, a productive programming layer um, that is directive-based allowing the programmer to express both parallelism and locality. In fact, we really like the programmer to express as much parallelism uh, as exists in their algorithm, rather than artificially chopping it up into pieces um, as, as people do today for particular machines. And then the last feature is a set of tools, things like compilers and runtime auto-tuners that can selectively exploit the parallelism that's been exposed at that, at that middle layer. Now, what about legacy codes today? Well, I will tell you that the naive porting of applications to highly parallel systems will not provide performance. This is not something that is, that is unique to, to GPUs. As we look at other more CPU-oriented systems that are adding much greater degrees of parallelism, uh, anybody who thinks they're going to be able to port their existing code over to those machines and get good performance, uh, I believe, is, is deceiving themselves. In today's codes are not optimized for that degree of parallelism or the locality that will be required. 
um, applications must be, uh, programs must be prepared to adjust their code to expose the orders of magnitude more parallelism that will be required. It is the job of, of, of companies like NVIDIA to build tools and programming systems to make, to make their lives easier, but uh, unfortunately, um, applications and uh, programmers will not be off the hook as a part of this equation as well. There's also an opportunity as we go to these, uh, these, these systems with, with much greater parallelism to consider alternative algorithms. And we've seen that in the world of GP computing. Sometimes you, you choose a different algorithm because you're running on uh, a GPU with its greater degree of, of parallelism that's available. So let me then transition to the final portion of this, of this discussion, uh, where I'll talk a little bit about Echelon, which is a research project uh, aimed at developing top technologies to get to exascale uh, in 2018. So this is a program um, that uh, we're working in collaboration uh, with many companies uh, and, uh, and academic institutions. Um, and it has several legs. So for example, uh, we're collaborating with Stanford, uh, Berkeley, and University of Utah on programming systems uh, for these, uh, for, uh, within the Echelon program. Uh, we're collaborating with the University of Texas, Penn, uh, and Cray on things like resilience and security and collaborating with Oak Ridge National Labs and, and Georgia Tech on applications that will be suited um, uh, to the scale of system. So our objectives um, really are in line with some of the challenges I described earlier. Uh, 100x better application level energy efficiency than, uh, than, than are, are possible in today's systems at the end. Uh, improved programmer productivity. Our goal is to make writing a parallel program uh, no harder than writing a serial program today. Now, writing a, serial, good serial, writing a bad serial program today is easy. Writing a good serial program today is not as easy. Um, but if we can at least bridge that gap so that uh, we get to the level of difficulty that people are, are accustomed to already, that I think will be a great accomplishment. Third goal is strong scaling for many applications. Okay. Um, what we mean by strong scaling is, is to first order as we increase the amount of parallelism in the machine, it makes applications um, that, have, uh, that are unchanged and have the same data set size uh, go faster. What this really means is the ability to mine out more and more fine-grained parallelism. The fourth goal, which I won't talk much about for the rest, for the rest of this presentation, um, is, uh, addressing the high, is addressing resiliency, making systems highly resilient to tolerate both hardware and software faults. So in terms of approach um, to the energy challenge, uh, we're examining architectures uh, that exploit heterogeneity including both throughput-optimized cores and latency-optimized cores. Latency-optimized cores to handle the serial portions of the application. Uh, these are cores that may look a lot like CPUs do today. And uh, throughput-optimized cores that are extremely energy efficient um, and will be responsible for managing most of, most if not all of the, uh, the parallelism um, and computation in the system. We're obviously also you know, trying to address all of those the, uh, the things I mentioned earlier in terms of uh, reducing uh, waste um, and exploiting uh, locality at much greater degrees um, to reduce the energy overhead. On the programming system side, uh, we're developing uh, techniques to exploit global address spaces across a large-scale machine um, and techniques and abstractions for expressing concurrently, concurrency and locality in a somewhat abstract fashion then is amenable to auto-tuning uh, software for mapping to particular pieces of hardware. So this diagram is a notional uh, uh, diagram of how we're envisioning this echelon system. Uh, so the uh, orange box you see on the left-hand side represents the chip itself. And here we see a large number of throughput-optimized cores. Um, a throughput-optimized core in this diagram is perhaps not so dissimilar from a streaming multiprocessor in today's GPUs. Um, this is where, this is where the, the bulk of the computation will occur, and this is where things will be extremely energy efficient. We also see, um, at least in this diagram, eight latency-optimized cores. Uh, these, again, are to facilitate the execution of the sequential portion of the program, uh, and also to, to, to serve as uh, sort of system management, perhaps handling um, uh, message protocol uh, processing. Uh, there's a large amount of memory capacity here shown in the LEVs, uh, uh, 1024 L2 banks connected to the system through a, uh, through a network on chip uh, or, or NOC. And then also connected to the system um, are multiple memory controllers for handling different levels of the memory hierarchy. Um, 
An interesting challenge as we, as we move towards exascale is achieving both high capacity and high bandwidth memory. Um, and we expect that we'll start to see more and more uh, heterogeneous memory systems with some, amount, some small amount of DRAM uh, perhaps stacked near or on top of, of uh, the computation dives themselves, and higher capacity uh, DRAM perhaps connected to the lower bandwidth path a little further away. There's also the opportunity to incorporate non-volatile RAM to, to facilitate both use of file system as well as the re as well as resiliency uh, in the system. Uh, we're also investigating incorporating um, network interfaces directly into the processor die themselves to try to alleviate the system from some of the energy and uh, uh, packaging overheads of having separate um, separate interconnect separate, separate network interfaces off of the, the chip itself. So. We, we incorporate all these pieces into uh, what we see as a node or node package, um, which we project will be in the order of 16 teraflops uh, peak for double precision, providing perhaps as much as uh, two terabytes per second to the fast DRAM, and perhaps supporting um, as much as half a terabyte of, of uh, DRAM capacity. These things can then be packaged up in a, a relatively straightforward fashion uh, to build larger scale systems. Just to give you a little bit of an inkling of what we're thinking about uh, inside the chip, uh, here you see what, what looks like a lot of very small boxes, um, but there's a couple of salient features here. So first, uh, if you look on the right-hand side, I've highlighted one of these throughput-optimized cores, um, and, uh, or one of the, let's say, cluster of throughput-optimized cores uh, that share some amount of access to, uh, to local memory, shown in the blue boxes, um, but also have interconnect out to connect to all of the other elements on the chip themselves. This particular uh, diagram shows uh, 256 of these throughput optimized cores in concert with these eight latency cores, which are labeled as locks uh, along the center column of the die. And then around the outside, you see uh, the large number of memory controllers that will be required to deliver the two terabytes of memory bandwidth that I was talking about. Um, According to our, our estimates at this point, in a 10 nanometer process, we could deliver uh, you know, 16 teraflops in a reasonable die size, um, under 300 millimeters squared. Now, as we aggregate these pieces together, this again is the node um, you know, showing uh, you know, approaching two terabytes per second of, of DRAM bandwidth, um, and also quite a bit of, of uh, network bandwidth, 160 gigabytes per second in this diagram. These nodes then get, get aggregated into cabinets. Uh, a cabinet would easily be able to accommodate 128 of these nodes, uh, including a set of routers to, to process the interconnection uh, among them, uh, supporting as much as two petaflops of, of peak performance. Um, and according to our, our energy estimates right now, on the order of 40 kilowatts. Assuming that that cabinet, uh, aggregating you know, on the order of 500 of these cabinets, uh, would produce a system on the order of an, of an exaflop um, in, a, in approximately 20 megawatts. 500 cabinets is large, um, but that's actually smaller than the number of cabinets that exist today in the, in the number one machine on the top that serves us. So that gives you at least a, a thumbnail sketch of some of the things that we're thinking about for this research project and kind of where we're going. But I want to bring this thing to a close, uh, this presentation to a close. From my perspective, the future of high performance computing um, is really dictated by these two challenges, which, uh, which I described earlier. Um, power constraints dictate extreme energy efficiency in every aspect of the system, from hardware to software. Um, those challenges will be hard, uh, but in some sense, those are challenges that can be you know, addressed uh, incrementally as we move forward from generation to generation. A larger challenge is really the programming system uh, as we restart that to scale. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be we need to be in the realm of billion-way parallelism, and the programming systems, tools, uh, and programmers need to be oriented to be prepared for that. If we show up with a system in 2018 um, that has a billion-way parallelism, it may be several years before people are, are able to run applications that they haven't been preparing for in advance. I would also argue that uh, all future interesting problems from high-performance computing uh, you know, all the way down, quite frankly, to the mobile space will also be cast as throughput workloads. Um, uh, and that's necessitated by the energy efficiency that will be required, but it's also matched to the types of things that, 
that people are, are wanting to do with, with their computer systems, processing large amounts of data, uh, real-time uh, sensor processing in, mobile, in the mobile space for just two examples. The, the other point I was going to make is that uh, if we look at GPUs, GPUs are, are, are new to the computing world. You know, five or six years is really all that, that GPUs have been used for general purpose computing. Um, and every generation, more features are added to make them more and more amenable to this. To this. And I would argue that GPUs are going to evolve to be the general purpose throughput processors. What were the role of CPUs? CPUs are important. It's important to have them. Uh, we need them for a variety of tasks, and uh, law mitigation, system support, and so on. Um, but in terms of their contribution to you know, end capability, particularly at large scale machines, CPUs may actually be good enough today. Um, and it may not make sense to devote a large fraction of the diet energy budget to those. We just may need a few of them uh, to operate our systems effectively. So that brings me to the end of my uh, my presentation, and I'm happy to field some questions. Well, thanks for that, Steve. I really appreciate how you, you kind of brought it together with this uh, high-level overview of where we've come from with the GPUs and where you guys would like to take the, the technology. I had a question about the overall DARPA program. Is this one of a set of similar projects with different uh, components or different uh, companies working on? Uh, yes. yes, that's correct. Um, so NVIDIA is, is the lead and prime contractor of one of the DARPA UHPC, or Ubiquitous High Performance Computing uh, Program projects. Uh, uh, the others that were, were announced in a press release by DARPA um, about a year and a half ago are being led by Intel, Sandia National Labs, and MIT. Now, are, are they working on different goals, or is it a, a parallel kind of project looking at the same kinds of uh, objectives? Um, to first order, the, the objectives are, are similar. Um, you know, the part of the mission that was given to uh, the different teams were to try to develop technologies that would deliver, uh, you know, a sustained performance um, in excess of, of a petaflop in a rack uh, in something south of, of, uh, of 60 uh, kilowatts. Um, so those are sort of the, the, the parameters writ large for, for the teams. Um, but uh, of course, the teams are, are are going after very different uh, approaches, and some and some people are are focusing perhaps more strongly on some aspects of the stack than others. Okay, and and do they operate in a separate silo? I mean, you don't meet in one big room and and see how each other are doing, do you? No, we don't. Um, the uh, our team is is has quite a bit of communication across you know, our team itself, and so there's actually a little bit a lot of cross pollination of, of ideas and concepts. Um, uh, we we have not. Uh, the intent was never to to collaborate, um, you know, in a, any sort of substantive uh, degree across the different uh, across the different teams. Um, so to first order, they're, they're kind of approaching these problems from different perspectives and independently. And then, Steve, I wanted to ask you about you know economies of scale, right? I mean, the the common. Uh, term that people say is, well, you know, NVIDIA got the gamers to pay for the development of this HPC technology, right? They, they had their requirements for more frames per second and better high resolution game um, technology. And we were able to apply that for parallel computing. It, do you foresee this, this technology that you guys are working on in the lab now? Um, is, is that going to be uh, a commodity type of technology in a, in a lesser scale, perhaps? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, as, as uh, a variety of people have probably discussed, you know, the HPC you know, market, uh, in order to have competitive uh, devices, really needs to have devices that have, have a day job. Um, and, you know, as you suggested, the uh, you know, graphics and, and gaming is a a you know, multi-billion dollar business that supports uh, you know, our Tesla high performance computing business. What also is interesting is, in addition to just the, just the general characteristics of, of the applications needing you know, high performance floating point, um, is that if you actually look at uh, what's happening in the gaming world, um, that's becoming much more focused on things like simulation, um, you know, fluids, cloth, and so on. And those are algorithms that uh, you know, are very familiar and common to things that appear in the high performance computing world. So there's this convergence in terms of at the algorithmic level as well. Um, so it's, you know, it's possible to actually see a tighter coupling between the needs in the, in the future.
for the technologies that we're working on um, that I described today, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, focusing on energy efficiency, making things more programmable. Uh, we're interested in things that that, uh, uh, that facilitate greater capability at the single GPU level, but also can be scaled to you know a small number of GPUs or all the way up to a, a to a large scale um, supercomputer. Um, so absolutely. Yeah. Well, I guess kind of a wrap up question here, Steve. You know, I, I saw a comment the other day on one of the exascale threads, and uh, the scientist said, you know. Exascale is not that ex exciting to me. What really gets me uh, worked up is the idea of an affordable petaflop, right? So they'd say, take one of those 500 cabinets you're envisioning here and just give him one of those at a price he could work with um, and afford, and he could really do some valuable science. Um, is that where we're headed? Are we looking at a, an affordable petaflop in the same kind of time frame? do you think? Oh, absolutely. I, I think I think we need to extend that argument. Um, there, there are additional people that that uh, don't even want the rack. Right? They want the desk side supercomputer. Um, and, you know, sort of, you know, many teraflops in something that may cost you know, you know a couple thousand dollars that they can put you know under their desk or under their graduate students' desks. And you know, I would argue that that, that we want to build systems uh, where the the underlying technology is exactly the same. And what, what differs is just the scale at which it's deployed. Well, terrific. Well, Steve Keckler, I want to thank you once again for uh, coming on the show today. My pleasure. You bet. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.